today. So I first want to introduce and give a big welcome, uh, thank you to Lulac and our student fellows. So with all of you. This box is going to kind of move a little bit. But, um, 
We, we were here, as Katie said, in 2018. And you all helped to propel the largest voter turnout in Texas since 1970. Young voter turnout because of students here at UTD is, was up 504% from the previous midterm election. We helped 12 new Democrats win election to the state legislature. Two Democrats win election to Congress, flipping control of that branch of our government. 17 black women elected to judicial positions. And we got really close, but we didn't get over the top. And I want you to know what's going to happen this time. Because you are here right now, because you are signing up to volunteer to knock on the doors of those voters who can make the difference in this election, we are going to win on the night of November 8th of 2019. We're going to win because we are fighting for every woman to make her own decisions about what We're going to win because we are fighting to make sure every child is prioritized over the interests of the NRA, the government. We are going to win because those teachers, those educators, those librarians, and those counselors who are fighting day and night to deliver for those kids who are working two jobs to make ends meet, who have to deal with all of this bureaucracy and a governor who is literally hounding them out of the classroom by the thousands. Not only will we have their backs and treat them with the respect and dignity that they're owed, but we're going to pay them enough so they don't have to work a second or a third job. Yeah. And we're going to make sure that they don't have to spend unnecessary classroom time preparing for a high-stakes, high-pressure test that in no way effectively measures the potential of that child or the yeah. effort. We are going to cancel the STAR test in the state of Texas. We are going to do smart, common sense, bipartisan things that meet the needs of our fellow Texans. Right now, today, we are 51st in the ability to see a mental health care provider in this country behind every other state and the District of Columbia. That means that far too many with clinical depression with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, go to the one place that they can receive any kind of care guaranteed, and that is the county jail system today, the largest provider of mental health care services in the state of Texas. When we win, we expand Medicaid, we bring $10 billion into the state. We the care that they need, and we make sure that we are healthy enough and well enough to live to our full potential. And so many of you have told me what you care most about right now is freedom. We talked about reproductive health care freedom, and yes, that's important. We're going to win the day. But I want to tell you about another kind of freedom. This country incarcerates, locks up more of its own citizens than any other nation on the planet today. Say what you will about China or Russia or North Korea or Iran. We put more of our own behind bars than they do. And this state, Texas, incarcerates more of its own than any other state in the union. And so many are serving time right now for nonviolent drug crimes, like possession of cannabis. And so we have a couple of ideas on how to deal with this. One, we're gonna legalize marijuana. And number two, given the fact that Texans of all races and ethnicities of all backgrounds use the stuff at roughly the same rate, it is unjust that disproportionately black and brown Texans will be stopped, frisked, incarcerated upon release, forced to check a box on every employment application form going forward, making it less likely that they get the job, harder to qualify for a student loan or a small business loan to create jobs that will employ other Texans. So in addition to legalizing, we are going to expunge the arrest records of anyone who said to Another reason I know we're going to win is we believe in this democracy and the right to vote. And we get that it's under attack here in Texas more than it is anywhere else in America today. 
harder to vote or to get your name on the roll so you can be registered to vote in Texas. 13% of the mail-in ballots cast this past March, the year of our Lord, 2022, were rejected. These are people who qualified for them, received them, filled them out, sent them in 13 out of 100 times. They got sent back. In fact, a World War II veteran, in other words, a guy who's willing to lose his life to fight fascism half a world away and defend democracy here at home, had his ballot by mail request rejected not once, but three times. There's no one among us who has more won the right to vote than that guy, and in this state, he can't do it. So, when we win, in addition to ensuring that we have online voter registration, same-day voter registration, automatic voter registration, so that when you turn 18, We are also going to make sure that we do smart things like replacing a system of gerrymander where members of Congress choose their voters. And then there's this idea. Right now there is on the books, believe it or not, a state holiday, an official state of Texas holiday known as Confederate Heroes Day. I propose that we replace that with Election Day as a holiday. One more reason I know that we're going to win, and that is we are running against perhaps the worst governor in the United States. I'll give it to you by the number. One month ago, the most extreme abortion ban in America that he signed into law last year went into effect. It begins at conception. There is no exception for rape. There is no exception for incest. It takes place at the epicenter of a maternal mortality crisis right here in Texas that claims the lives of black women at three times the rate as white women right here in the state of Texas, this new law will definitely ensure the deaths of women in this state. But there are some among us who despair and are even tempted to submit and to succumb to this and say, look, there is no hope. This is Texas Beto. Nothing we can do. And I remind you of this. 50 years ago in Texas, Abortion was just as illegal as it is today. And no one rode to the rescue of Texas women to save the day and protect their right to choose. In fact, it was Texas women themselves who stood up, rose to the occasion, and overcame that challenge. Jane Roe and her two attorneys. Those three Texas women won protection for the right to privacy, to make very personal, often very painful decisions without fear of government intrusion and interference. And Roe versus Wade stood the test of time for nearly half a century. So here's my thinking, and I want to know what you think about it. If Texas women won that right back 50 years ago, they're going to win it back this year. In I'll give you another number. It's been 19 weeks since 19 children and their two teachers were taken from us in Uvalde, Texas on the 24th of May, 2022. Those kids, absolutely defenseless against someone who was able to walk into their classroom armed with a weapon originally designed, engineered, and sold to the United States military for use in combat and war. To be able to take an enemy soldier down at 500 yards, penetrate a steel helmet, and knock him down dead. Those kids were not at 500 yards, they were at 5 feet max. Nothing on their head but maybe a baseball cap. Their parents, who I've met and talked to and listened to and I'm working with right now, only able to identify their bodies by the shoes that their kids were wearing. Those kids were defenseless against all of that and against a governor who refuses to lift a finger to make it any less likely that any other child, your younger brothers and sisters, our three kids in El Paso, Texas, do not meet that same fate. But that is not their permanent future or fortune in Texas. The answer is right in front of us if we choose to act. Look, we may not agree on every piece of this, but as I've listened to our fellow Texans, Republicans, gun owners, Democrats, big city, rural communities alike, on this much we agree. One, let us raise the age of purchase for an AR-15 to 21. Yeah. That yeah. Intervention. Two, let's have a red flag law on the books so we can intervene before it's too late. If you're threatening to shoot yourself 
or shoot somebody else, we need due process to intervene and retrieve that firearm before that massacre takes place. That would have averted the tragedy in Uvalde, in El Paso, in so many other instances. And this last one, a universal background check. And all that means is that if you buy a gun, no matter who you buy it from in the state of Texas, a federally licensed firearm dealer or somebody out of the back of their trunk, they have to perform a background check. They have to vet you to make sure that you're not gonna harm yourself or anyone else in your life or anyone else in our lives. Those three ideas will save so many lives, allow us to defend the Second Amendment while better protecting the lives of our kids, those children in the classrooms, those teachers who already sacrificed so much for them, and do something about the fact that today in Texas under Greg Abbott, gun violence is the leading cause of death for children and teenagers. Because in addition to these massacres that we all know about, every single day in Dallas, in Houston, in San Antonio, throughout the state, we lose people, overwhelmingly young people, and far too often people from communities of color disproportionately to gun violence, so numbingly common, their names won't make the newspaper, their faces will not be seen on the nightly news. We can do something about it. And these young people, not yet old enough to vote, only get a voice in this action through what we are willing to do. So if ever there was a reason to vote and to get registered to vote before October 11, it is this one and we've got to do it now. Tell me what you think on this one. <laughs> one more number that I want to share with you. Actually two more. This one is 18. That's the number of months that it's been since when the temperature dropped in the state of Texas the power went out in the energy capital of the world. The heat stopped running. The lights would no longer work. Your water stopped flowing because it was frozen in the pipes above you. And then when it unfroze, those pipes burst and it ruined your floorboards. Mold started running up your walls to the ceilings. $10 billion in property damage took place in the state of Texas. 700 people lost their lives, froze to death in their beds right here in the state of Texas died of carbon monoxide poisoning in the garage, or burned up with their families as they set fire to their furniture, desperately trying to keep themselves warm so they too would not freeze to death. And while that's going on, our governor, Greg Abbott, pegs the price of electricity at its highest allowable rate, not for minutes or hours, but for days. That meant that gas, which powers our turbines, soon started tripping at 200 times the rate it had sold for the day before. Those energy traders and pipeline CEOs made $11 billion in profit over five days. It was the largest theft and transfer of wealth in Texas state history. And to add insult to injury, the grid is still not fixed. Our utility bills have gone up on average 45 bucks per rate payer. Greg Abbott now, the single greatest driver of inflation in the state of Texas. But we've got an answer to this. One, we win this election. Yes. And then we winterize, weatherize the grid. We connect ERCOT, our grid, to the national grid to bring down power. And for those who stole the $11 billion from us, we take those bastards to court and get every single And now my last number, and it is the number eight. That is the number of years that Greg Abbott has served as the governor of the state. I want you to remember that as the deflection and the distraction and the lies and the attacks from him start to mount. If I had a record that was as failed as the one that I just described, I might very well do the same thing. Um, you ask him why he can't keep the lights on and he'll point to critical race theory and try to make us afraid of our history and the stories of each and every single Texan. You ask them why teachers are leaving the profession by the thousands, and he'll say, look out for that transgender kid over there. We gotta arrest her parents and turn them in for child abuse and turn that kid over to CPS, the worst run foster care program in the United States. Yeah. And if they'll do this, they'll say, watch out. They're going to defund the police and allow criminals out of jail, and you're going to lose your lives, and they're going to come and get you, your kids, and especially your daughters. <laughs> That's the effect that I wanted to have on that. <laughs> but I want you to 
you to hear this from me directly because these are the facts. When it comes to crime and especially violent crime, homicides are up in this state under Greg Abbott 50%. And it has nothing to do with Joe Biden or AOC or even Beto O'Rourke, who has not held office since 2019. And at that time, I was in Congress. This guy ignored the law enforcement that he claims to trust when they begged him not to sign something called permitless carry into law. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, we used to have a program in Texas called License to Carry. It meant that you could carry a gun in public as long as we went through a background check, as long as you took some training so we were assured that you were proficient in this firearm before you use it, especially if you're gonna use it in public. Over the last six years, 38,000 times, law enforcement deemed one of our fellow Texans too dangerous to carry that firearm in public. Maybe they have a violent criminal history, or they've abused a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or they have a history of self-harm. And so to protect the public and our fellow Texans, 38,000 times they did the right thing. Well, this governor turned his back on law enforcement and looked right at the NRA and signed this into law. And now homicides up 50% more police officers have been gunned down in the state of Texas than any other. We lead the nation in school shootings right here in the state of Texas. Greg Abbott owns every piece of that. When it comes to rape, the governor who been signing that abortion bill and asked by a reporter, Mr. Governor, what are you gonna do about the fact that there's no exception for rape in this abortion ban? His response was, we will eliminate rape in the state of Texas. I don't know if you remember that thing. You deserve to know that more rapes have been committed in the state of Texas than anywhere else in America. Our ability to bring a perpetrator to justice under Greg Abbott has declined in half because there are thousands of untested rape kits at DPS headquarters in Austin, Texas right now. Don't ever allow him to persuade you that this is about life or about heartbeats or about the life of the mother. This is about power and control, especially over the women of this state. It was about life. You would do something about the rapes and murders that were taking place, the hundreds of kids who died in CPS care, the level of gun violence that we see against our kids right now. No, we really believe that it's important to deter crime in this state. That's why we will make sure that not only do we fully fund law enforcement, we fund that training that will ensure all of us, regardless of race or ethnicity, are treated the same under the law in this state. And whenever someone, whenever someone in a position of public trust fails that most basic bar of their job, we hold them accountable. We ensure that there is justice. When those who are unarmed die in police custody, when we have a Tatiana Jefferson, when we have Sandra Bland, when we have both and John, those two just here in North Texas, just in recent memory, then we know that we have a problem. Holding those responsible and accountable to justice means that we ensure that there is greater trust, more people willing to report crimes, serve as witnesses, testify in trials. We improve safety and security in the state of Texas. And this last piece that I want to tell you, because this is the governor's chosen ground. If he ever wants to distract or deflect or to incite fear or even hatred, he's going to talk about immigrants and he's going to talk about the border. Now, let me begin by admitting or acknowledging or reflecting back to you that we do have serious concerns at our border with Mexico. We have a badly broken system of immigration. We have far too much fentanyl and other illegal drugs and human beings who are smuggled and trafficked into this country as well. We must be more vigilant and more successful against those threats. But the vast majority of those who are trying to come here right now seek to work jobs in this community, in this state, that no one born here, for whatever reason, is willing to work. They want to join family members, and right now from Mexico or India, the Philippines, they find themselves at the back of a 20-year line in order to do this the right way. And those asylum seekers, people who have literally traveled the length of this continent, 2,000 miles with their kids in tow, riding atop a train known as the Beast or La Bestia, much of that on foot. They get to our front door here. The adjudication wait time for an asylum claim to this country is six years. That means you might find yourself in a refugee camp in Ciudad Juarez with your little kid for six 
years waiting for your number to be called, hoping somehow that you and that child are going to survive. And listen, you all saw the story about the 53 migrants and asylum seekers who died in the back of that container, that 18-wheeler in San Antonio earlier this year. What would cause you to get into the back of that truck? What would cause you, once you're in the back of that truck, to reach down and pull up the hand of your 11-year-old daughter? You don't do it for kicks. You don't do it to steal somebody else's job or place in society or to get free health care and benefits. You do it probably because to remain in your country of origin might very well mean the death for you and that kid. John Lewis, who I was lucky enough to serve with for six years in the United States Congress, used to say, look, at one time or another, our families all came here, and we came here in a different ship. Um, some crossed the Bering Strait 15,000 years ago, and it's a reminder that where I stand right now is indigenous land that was claimed before any European arrived on this continent. There are those who were kidnapped from Africa, brought here in bondage, and forced against their will literally to build the wealth and the success of this so-called democracy back in the 18th and 19th, and even well into the 20th century, without ever being able to share in the success that they made possible. And then there are those, like my family, their works, who knew in the 19th century that to stay in Ireland meant to die in Ireland. There was a famine that claimed the lives of a million people. And they came to the one place that would take them in. That is America, that is our story, that is Texas, that is the foundation of our greatness in the first place. So what I propose is that instead of these stunts, like sending migrants on buses to Chicago, or building a mile and a half of border wall, or trapping in this, trafficking in this hateful rhetoric of invasions, or animals, or infestations, which are the words that are used by those in power to describe the most powerless among us, I say that we focus on solutions. What if there was a Texas-based guest worker program that allowed you to legally, safely, and in an orderly fashion come here to work jobs in these communities, and if you want to, to return to your country of origin to be with your family? What if Texas led the way in raising these visa caps so the wait time is no longer 20 years, and for those dreamers who are already here, we lead the way in making them fully legal as you will see. What if, what if for those asylum seekers, the adjudication wait time is not six years, but six months or six weeks? We get them an answer so that they and we can get on with our lives. Not only would we be living to our values, reflecting the reality of our immigrant-rich communities, we would no longer see the kind of hate-inspired attacks against our fellow Americans and human beings. On the 3rd of August, 2019, the day after Governor Abbott sends out a mail that says about this so-called invasion, Texans, we must defend ourselves. We must take matters into our own hands. A young man in Allen, Texas, not too far from here, drove himself and an AK-47 650 miles to El Paso. When he got there, he posted a message on social media, and he said, look, I have come to El Paso to repel that invasion of migrants, specifically of Hispanics, who are taking over this state and replacing me as a white man in Texas. It is the same fear that fueled that massacre in Buffalo not too long ago. That hatred that those in power are trafficking in right now cost the lives of 23 people who were killed in that Walmart in El Paso in a matter of minutes in a city so peaceful that it regularly doesn't lose 20 people over the course of a year. El Paso so safe, not despite, but because it is a city of immigrants. We are going to get back to our We are going to do the right by and for one another, and we are going to do this together. It will not be the candidate or my political party that wins this election. It will be the people of Texas. And those who have been targeted for suppression and intimidation, those who have been drawn out effectively of this democracy, they are the very people that I'm asking for your help now, at this moment, to go out and reach. For those who are in these yellow reflective vests, they have a clipboard with open shifts. You sign your name there, we'll put you in front of those Texans to invite them in. Number one reason given by those who haven't voted in the past 
is that no one ever asked them to. All they're doing right now is waiting for you to show up. So we have four days left to get on the rolls to be registered to vote. October 11th is our deadline. Fewer than three weeks to begin casting votes during early voting, which begins on October 24th. And we're just shy of a month from election day, the 8th of November. We can and we will win this election if you join this campaign and make that decision now. You all ready to win? Les agradezco, muchísimas gracias. Nos vemos la próxima vez.